I don't know about you, but as I was listening, I was watching the wise men on their camels. Making their way. I, I heard, by the way, I, I, I don't know if you knew this, there was a fourth wise man. Three of them brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The fourth guy brought fruitcake. That's why you don't hear about him. Somebody's got to... Somebody's got to do this. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Holy I confess. Holy I confess. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive. I'm about to receive. The incorruptible. The indestructible. The indestructible. The indescribable. The indescribable. The indescribable. The ever living seed of the word of the Lord. The ever living seed of the word of the Lord. Lord. And I will never be the same. And I will never, never be the same. Never be the same. Never be the same. Amen. 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 Well, we'd like to welcome each and every one of you who've come today online. We're glad you're here. Amen. I always say, you know, you, I hope you drink a good cup of coffee. Or some of you don't drink coffee. One of my friends, he says, I don't drink coffee. It's bad for your health. So, so I give him license to drink milk or orange juice. But I hope you've had something this morning. And you've come into the house of God. I thought about this. When we gather, whether you're at home or whether you're here, we gather into the presence of the Most High. Amen. Amen. Then Isaiah would cry out, Woe is me, for I've seen the Lord high and lifted up. Yes. Our attitude of worship, folks. We come into the sanctuary. This, this building is empty during the week, with the exception of Wednesday evening. There's, there's very few people walking the halls. It is a building that the church gathers in. Did you get that? Amen. Because when you walk out the front door, the church is gone. The church has gone home. It's gone to each respective place where there you will take the word of God to other people. Amen. That's how it works. Now, if you're watching online, we would encourage you, because you can do this, you can take and and take the message that you get and hit the send button. Send it to somebody. Amen. Send it to somebody you don't like even. <laughs> How about that? Because you never know. They might watch it and find Jesus. That's the whole goal of this is that we get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to the world. Yes. I like that. God called me to be an evangelist. And then when I hit 50, obviously if you look, you notice I'm over 50. A couple years. <laughs> when, when I hit 50, I had eight, eight guys call me to do revivals. And I said, okay, I don't have a calendar with me, but, but you call me back and we'll put it on a calendar. Not one of them ever called me back. <laughs> and, it was, and, and I thought God called me to go on the road after I hit 50. Well, here I am. And I've been here a couple years since then. And guess what? COVID hit. And I became a worldwide evangelist. How about that? Amen. Isn't that cool? Amen. Anyway, we're glad to be online. So, so folks, God bless you. May his face shine on you and may he use you. And uh, by the way, if, if the Lord lays in your heart to help us in our ministry here locally, uh, the recipe is online and it, how you can give. So uh, we encourage you to do that because after all, if you're not attending a church, then you ought to be investing in somewhere with your tithe and offering. Amen. That's what the Bible talks Amen. about. So, so we're, on, we're on the third week, actually, but um, today we're going to look at Matthew's story in our admin story. Last week was Mark's story, and, and, and what, what, what we're doing is focusing a little bit different than what we always do. So we're in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 25, chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. Am I going to read all the verses? By the way, because I like big type, I do print this out of my, my sermon notes so that I cannot miss a word. But I, I'm going to read some of it. I'm not going to read all of it. But I, I just want you to get this, that, that Matthew is speaking to the Jews. So when he talks about Jesus, he's going to connect the dots of lineage. Don't you like that story? Amen. Mm -hmm. So 
chapter 1, verse 1, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Did you get that? Yeah. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. And Judah begat Perez and Te Zerah and by Tamar. And Perez begat Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amdadab. And Amdadab begot Nashon. And Nashon begot Solomon or Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab. We're getting into the Old Testament, some of the great stories in this area. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king. Are you getting the story? Amen. The connection? David the king begat Solomon. By her who had been the wife of Uriah, Delilah. Solomon begat Rehoboam. Rehoboam begat Abner. And Abner begat Asha. Asha begat Josephat. Jumping Josephat. Have you ever heard that? Jo Josephat begat Joram. Joram begat Uzziah. Uzziah begat Jotham. And Jotham begat Ahaz. Ahaz begat Hezekiah. Hezekiah, one of my favorites, begat Manasseh. Manasseh begat Ammon. Ammon begat Josiah. We could go through all of these, after the, and, and it, it takes them right through. And then it says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. So if you ever wonder what Joseph's dad named, it was Jacob, but not the Jacob way back. Listen to this. <clears throat> Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 16, chapter 1. Amen. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David until captivity of Babylon are 14 generations and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Verse 18, now the birth of Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, listen to this, being a just man. Not wanting to make her public example, was minded to put her away quietly or secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, and whenever you hear behold, remember, that means pay attention. Mm -hmm. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and shall bring forth a son, and you shall call him his name, Jesus. Don't you like this? For He will save His people from their sin. Amen. So this was all done, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call His name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. You want to talk about God in the flesh, God with us. So we read this whole story to find out that this is God with us. I could preach right there, but i got more to go. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Amen. Now, that gets us through chapter 1. But there's more. Chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, again, pay attention, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, from the east going west. And they came to Herod, chapter, verse 2, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. While Herod the king also heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Hallelujah. And then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what the star, what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Mm -hmm. My Lord. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, pay attention, the star which they had seen in the east 
went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. These are wise men, rich men, traveling from a long ways away. Ecstatic because it brought them where they were supposed to go. Verse 11, when they came to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, but divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. By the way, they didn't have GPSs. Did you know that? Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, get to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Understand, when the message went to Herod, his own religious leaders knew there would be weeping and sorrow because they knew who Herod was. When he arose, he took the child and his mother by night, departed to Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Amen. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the districts from two years and under. Wow. According to the time which he had determined from the wise men, and then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Amen. Verse 19, when Herod was dead. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. And then he arose and took the child, the young child and his mother, and they came to the land of Israel. Now you wonder where Nazarenes came from. Here it is. And when he heard that Archelaus, Archelaus was reigning over Judah instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came to and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he should be called a Nazarene. I just added that. Now really, really, he was not a Nazarene by denomination, you understand that? By location, is why they call that. So it's the second week of December now. So we had... We had uh, the first message on Advent, the last week of November. Last week we talked about marching, and, and today a little bit of, I'm not sure, I, I got up this morning, everything was white. I almost put a white jacket on. <laughs> everything was white, I saw and that. I started the car up, and when I got out there it all melted off, and it was back to the regular color, so here I am. Radio stations playing Christmas music. By the way, they started way early. When, when you start before Halloween, that's too early. <laughs> Go to Costco and Sam's, and they've got Christmas junk up because they want you to buy stuff. The greatest gift ever given that cost heaven all was Jesus. I like that. And I like Christmas, don't get me wrong. But I hate the commercialization of it. I sometimes think we ought to quit buying gifts. And we ought to just write a note of how much we love those that are in our circle. Amen, Pastor. By the way, then it would stop the competition. Well, Mama's going to get me $50 worth of stuff. I probably ought to buy her something worth $50. We would never do that, would we? <laughs> or if you're like me, I, I have a terrible time. I... I would not make a good a good person to buy stuff. I, I have I I struggle. What do I buy, Judy? What do I buy her? A chocolate bar? <laughs> There's so much stuff out there. She says, What do you want for Christmas? I have her, that's everything. Oh, baby. oh isn't that sweet? <laughs> but I do. I, I, I don't need anything. I've got I've got eight kids. Adopted, two biological, a lot of grandkids. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a church family that loves me. Amen. Does it get better than that? No. And got a coffee cup. I 
sometimes think that it's overdone sometimes. But, but, but anyway, so, so, so we're walking around. Hallmark. Have you watched TV? Hallmark. Movie after movie after, after movie. After movie. Disney's tossed in their hat, and they're doing movie after movie after movie. If that doesn't tell you Christmas is here, nothing else will. <laughs> now, if you come to this sanctuary right now, we don't, we haven't gone overboard on Christmas stuff. We have, I have two Christmas trees in here. Can you see them? No. Well, that's because they're right in front of you. You're up front, almost by me. One of them. Right there. Yeah. Because I, I have the Christmas season, you know. Anyway, so, so as, as we're, we're going along and we're looking at Christmas Advent, by the way, Advent preparation, and, and so almost every church does this, but we, we start and each week we bring a, a, a picture of the coming of the Christ. And so we're taking a look at how each gospel writer approached and anticipated the story of Christ. And each one comes from a different look. Mark wrote to the Romans. Matthew's writing to the Jews. And he gives you the complete lineage because he wants to connect the dots. And you're going to find some stuff today you didn't know. Maybe. So, so, so last week, the question of why. Why keep looking after, at these stories? Why keep looking all these years? We've heard this story over and over again. Haven't we told the story of Christmas enough? No. No, we haven't really told these stories enough. You see, you can't tell the story of Christ and His birth enough. Did you get that? Amen. Amen. The fact is, outside of the Christmas season, and more specifically outside of the church, this story is not told at all. And in a government and a society that wants to stamp it out and make it foolishness, we, folks, are the only reason, if Christianity makes it through, continues in America, it's because we told the story of the birth of Christ and who He is and who He is to us. Amen. We're in, I mentioned last week, we're in the, what they call the post-Christian era in America and other nations where we've gone out and brought Jesus to them are sending people to America to evangelize the place where the gospel came out of, not originated from, but came out of because... We were so zealous in the early days as a nation. And, and so the stories, you, you, if you stop telling the story, it then reminds people that this is not an important story. Are you getting it? Amen. If we're not talking about Jesus all the time, then it's not important enough to pass on to our children. The untold stories are the ones that aren't passed on to succeeding generations. In other words, the little children that are here this morning need to hear this story from the time they crawl until they die. Amen. Amen. And it never gets old. Does it get old? I, I, every Christmas we come back to this, and every Easter we come to the resurrection, and, and I find myself in awe at each step we take in reading the Word of God because I'm thinking, how could a God who created this thing and said, light be and, and, and earth, let this happen and, and separate the water and the, and, and the land and, and light and darkness and all this other stuff, how can He do that and then want to make somebody in His image and He puts us loose, turns us loose and then His Son would say, come to me all you who labor and are weary and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Yes. Take my yoke upon you, learn me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. We've got to keep the story going. We've got to keep it alive. I want to tell you, even if you don't know how to tell the story, you have the Bible, and most of you can read well enough that you can learn enough that if the Bible were taken away, you should be able to survive spiritually. Amen. Why do we want to tell the story? We, we want Jesus... We want Jesus to be a part of the main frame of our world view. Amen? Amen. Amen? We want redemption's plan and story to be an important part of who we are and the heritage we live. And, and I was thinking, if, if I had a song that I'd sing before I die, it would be by and by when I look on His face, thorn-riven face. By and by when I look on His face, I wish I could have given Him more. Amen. More. Amen. So much more. You see, our goal, folks, is not, I've done enough. And, and I'm, I want to tell you something. In, in, in Christianity, there may be retirement for pastors. There may be retirement for other things. But I didn't find anywhere in God's Word where it said we retire and quit being Jesus people. Amen. 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 
that it should be a passion that burns in our souls. We want to tell the story to others. We've got to. If we don't, it depends on us, you see. Thank you. It's easy for us to get caught up in this secularism and, 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 and paganism is invaded it's invaded our season. You understand that? That that it's easy to make this thing a Santa Claus thing rather than a Jesus story. Wow. Now I love Jesus story and I, I don't mind Santa Claus. One of the ladies in my church one time, because I, I told her how I felt about Santa Claus, and she said, Well, it's the spirit of giving, Pastor, that Santa Claus is. Okay. I'm not opposed to that. But I want you to understand that, that there's no such thing as an elf. There's a good, happy person from Germany who handed out gifts that he made year long. That might be where, where the only Santa Claus really originated from. And then Disney got involved and made him an elf and magic. Did you get that? <coughs> now, I'm not telling you not to have fun with it. But I'm just saying, folks, Jesus is the reason why we celebrate Christmas. Right. Let us not ever get so caught up because listen some of this Christmas stuff has become paganism because Jesus has moved aside and we've gone to the magic of a Santa Claus and a rabbit on Easter is it okay to say that? because I already said it <laughs> thank you very much Mike or Pastor Mike if you want to give me the title just don't do the very reverend okay the whole thing is this. We, we need to be reminded of the purpose and significance of Jesus' revival here. Amen? He came here for a reason. And, and so my job is to remind you why He came. Amen. And what He did. And why on earth that this God of creation would think enough of us who are lost and undone and we're killing animals to try to find sacrificial forgiveness and it ain't working and mountains of dead flesh of animals and redemption's plan has not been presented and then Jesus comes on the scene. Amen. And He lives here 33 years and He becomes the, the, the sacrifice that only could bring redemption for us. Yes. That once and for all He died on the cross that we might have life and have it abundantly. Whew. Lord Jesus. I can get excited about this but I'm going to stay calm. Hallelujah. And I, I want you to get this. Uh, so what matters most in this Christ Advent and the purpose of His Advent is that Jesus came for a reason and He is the reason we do Christmas. Amen. Amen. Christmas. By the way, I, 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 I'm going to toss this out. I thought about this. Do you remember several years ago before Trump was president they said Happy Holiday! <laughs> Have you noticed how many... They, now by the way what they don't get is holiday, holy day. Did you get that? Yes. I didn't shout it too loud, did I? So, the, so even though they shut, try to shut Christ out, if you say happy holidays, you're saying happy holy days. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Anyway, so, so I'm just saying. So, 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 but, but, but I've noticed even the big on TV. You listen, you listen. There's everybody saying Merry Christmas. If Trump didn't do anything else good for us, he did Merry Christmas for us. Amen. Amen. Just thought I'd throw that out there. And, and if you're a Democrat, hey, just, it's okay. All right? It's okay. I, I, I know many of them. They're good friends of mine. We all agree. Merry Christmas. I like that, don't you? Amen. But, but we're, so we're celebrating this. So when we do Advent messages, you've got to understand, there's a reason because Jesus came as the love gift that God gave and the price he paid with Jesus. Was for us. So what each gospel writer does, he tells the story to establish. Are you ready for this? To establish the fact of Jesus' coming and the reason for his coming. I like that. By the way, by the time this was written, uh, probably Jesus already ascended. When the disciples, you understand, when they started writing this stuff down. They thought he was coming right back within a few weeks or months or a year. And as time passed, they're going, we better write this story down because it's going to be lost if we don't. So the legitimacy of Christ. The message is drawn from two chapters of Matthew 1 and 2, of course. Matthew was written after the ascension of Jesus. Let's start to tell you that. Because, as I said, we better get it written down. Is that okay? Amen. So the purpose of the book was to help people... Are you ready for this? 
The purpose of writing Matthew's Gospel is to help people who had never seen Jesus. Who had never met Jesus. Who had never heard Jesus. Can you imagine what it would have been like to sit on the hillside with 5,000 men and women and children and Jesus talks to them and then feeds them fish and chips? Have you ever thought about how they got those fish and chips? They weren't. There was no McDonald's or Burger King. They couldn't go to Walmart. They're just sitting on a hillside. Amen. And Jesus said, because the disciples said, "Send them away." Remember the story. Send them away. Get them out of here. We don't have enough money to feed them. Jesus said, "Well, what do you have?" Well, hang on a minute, Lord. Now I'm thinking, maybe Jesus said, uh, we're going to take a break. The latrines are over here, men over there, women. No, he, no, he didn't do that, right? No. I think Jesus kept on preaching, but he said, work yourselves around the crowd and find out how much food there is, because we're going to take, it's your job to take care of it. Amen. Wouldn't you love to have been one of the 12 guys right then? <laughs> Ain't no way. So they get done canvassing 5,000 people. And by the way, out in that crowd, they had food. You know they did. Amen. Well, we found this little boy. He's got some loaves and fishes. That's enough. Jesus didn't say, keep on crowing. He said, that's enough. That's right. I'm giving you Mike's translation. And then the Bible said he blesses it. And he feeds 5,000 people. I want you to understand this. See, they had never seen Jesus, some of these people. They never met him and they never heard him. I would have loved to have been on that hillside, wouldn't you? Amen. One, I'm hungry for fish and chips now. <laughs> but I'm thinking, oh, by the way, this is a bonus. When they got done, when they got done, remember the disciples said, there's no way we can do this? When they got done, you know how many baskets of food they had left over 12? Everybody ate till they could eat no more. That wasn't in my notes, but it had to be in there. Lord Jesus. That there were people who would never know Jesus had Matthew and Mark and Luke and John not told this story that we're going to share. Lord, yeah. So Matthew, Matthew is written to the Jewish believers in Jesus. And, and, and it was a reference to Hebrew scripture, more, more of that than other gospels. But there's a lot of prophecies that, that Matthew mentions that you find in the book of Hebrews, by the way, if you want to read over there. Matthew begins his story by establishing the legitimacy of Jesus, that he was God's plan, not from when Mary met the Holy Spirit and talked to him, or the angel, but the plan way, 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 way back. So Isaiah and other prophets could tell about this one who was going to come. Don't you like that? Amen. Now remember, to the Jews, genealogy was important. You all know what genealogy... Have, have any of you ever traced your genealogy? Yeah. No. Ever taken, uh, ever taken one of those tests to find out where you came from? Yeah. All, 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 all my life, from the time I was a little kid, I was told that, that my grandfather, my mom's side, was, was, had a lot of Indian in him, and the rest of the family was German. And I'm not going to find out. But if I was a part of the Indian tribe, I'd be part of the Hakkasai tribe. You heard them, right? Because they're a bunch of cut-ups. So, so, that was a saw. I, you saw that coming, right? Uh, so, so, so Matthew writes this because it's important for, for the Jews to have this laid out, how they are connected to Jesus. Why Jesus would have a right to even do anything. So, so, it's, so, so it, come, it comes, this genealogy has a lot of, of, of traditional importance to Jews and to their society. And, and, and so the knowledge of tribal origins was important to them. And by the way, it was used to assign the place in the marching order or pecking order of, of Israel in the wilderness. If you read through, when they got Moses, took all the people out of the children, uh, took them all out, they all, according to the tribe, were put in a group. You understand that, right? And then later on, when they got to Canaan, it had to do with their allocation of land in Canaan, what they were going to inherit. And then to determine property rights and ownership. And then finally, there's business of marriage and inheritance and loans and liens. It all affected some way by the ability to prove to who you were related to. Don't you like that? Wow. Matthew used genealogy to speak to the point 
in his gospel, he establishes that Jesus Christ, I want you to get this now, that Jesus Christ is indeed Messiah King, Messiah King of Israel's expectation. Amen. And so he announces at the very beginning that Jesus is both the son of David and the son of Abraham. It's important to clarify that if you're going to tie this thing together. So Jesus can claim kingship because why? Because he's a descendant from King David. Amen. And through his legal father Joseph, he can prove his Jewishness without question by tracing his direct line from Joseph to Abraham. I read all that to you, correct? And so genealogy is about establishing Christ's claim and rights to Messiah King. He's not only Messiah, God's gift to us, but He's a King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, amen. It was critical. It was critical that the Jewish believers in Christ, who'd never known Him personally, who were the next generation or the next generation or the next generation, could feel secure in knowing that this is the one that God planned on. And it was important that they felt sure Jesus was the true deliverer, the true deliverer of them, like Moses. Amen. The rightful ruler of Israel. Amen. Don't you like that? Amen. Then there was an, there's an extraordinary difference in Jesus. If you go to verses 18 through 25, Matthew talks about the difference of Jesus by highlighting his origin and its ordinary or extraordinary picture here. So we look at Matthew chapter 1, we see, we see this Advent, Advent story, because here he is. Baby Jesus, angels, Mary and Joseph, chapter 2, shepherds and the wise men, and King Herod. So, jingle the bells. Hey, we should have brought some bells in here and had you do that. <laughs> String the lights. Because the warmth and good cheer of Christmas is on the scene because Jesus has been born and it's announced and shepherds got to go and the wise men came and, and all these wonderful things happened. The angels got to sing. How long do you think they practiced that choir special before they got to come? You know, because we always, you ever, if you ever did a cantata, we practiced weeks. We did a Christmas cantata and an Easter cantata and then sang specials. And we would start weeks and weeks in advance and do extra practices to get it totally noteworthy. It was amazing. And I did, I did John Peterson Katatis took the high sopranos way high and the basses way low. And, and so, it's pretty good. Now, by the way, it took me two sermons to get to Jesus, to this part of his birth. You like that? And I'm saying, too bad. <laughs> I just like this story. I love this story. So Matthew, Matthew, Matthew introduces Jesus with all these great extra things. By the way, Christ's origin was quite different because the Bible said he was conceived how? By the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And he was born to a virgin. Amen. 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 Can I tell you, it might be kind of hard to find some of those today because our society has become so loose. Is that sad? Is that sad? Very sad. Mm -hmm. Christ's origin was different. I just like this. It was miraculous. It was a miracle. It, it was something that, that, that we don't think about, but it was totally different than ever before. And Matthew doesn't argue the point or justify how unlikely it is or how weird. I mean, can you imagine if your daughter came to you and said, I've got to tell you this, Mom. But an angel came to me this afternoon and says, I'm going to have a baby. And it's going to be the Holy Spirit. What are you on anyway? <laughs> I mean, have you thought about the story? How is Mary going to break her term on me? You're not going to believe this. She's 13 years old or 14. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the interesting things in the story is that she has such a connection with God that when she was told she was going to have a child, you know what her answer was? Are you out of your mind? No. No, she said, so be it. Amen. Mary, you don't know what you're getting into. Mary, do you realize you're going to be labeled for the rest of your life because you're not even married yet? You're never going to get this off your back. It'll follow you everywhere. So be it. You're going to have a child and he's going to be a savior. He's going to save his people. So be it. I mentioned last week, can you imagine being Jesus' brothers? 
Jesus never did that. Ever think about that? Mama's saying to, to James, you shouldn't do it that way because Jesus never did it that way. Aren't you glad, aren't you, glad you want one of the siblings? And so Matthew gets surprised. But it's kind of like Matthew says, don't be surprised that Jesus made such an extraordinary claims that he did such extraordinary things because he was extraordinary from before he was born. Don't you like that? From the very beginning. This was beyond any comprehension of any kind of mankind things that we've got, that's for sure. And then if the story would have been more mind-boggling by itself, Matthew added something else. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, to show that Jesus' birth was prophetic and by fulfillment, Matthew makes sure to quote the prophecy. The Lord will give you a sign, the Bible says. The virgin will be with child and will give birth unto a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. Amen. Which means God with us. The, 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 to the prophet and to Matthew, Emmanuel wasn't used as a proper name. It's God with us. I like this. It's used to describe the Messiah King's state of being. Not who, but what he is. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Not identity, nature. Did you get that? And it's used by Isaiah and Matthew. Emmanuel is about God coming among us. That God who created this and spoke it into being is now among us in our presence. Amen. I get goosebumps just thinking of it. Matthew is telling his audience that Jesus was God among men. He's saying that Jesus is the embodiment of God. We're told here that in the very opening paragraphs of Matthew's story that Jesus is here. Amen. That the nature of God, you want to see the nature of God, look at Jesus. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus shows you what God is like. Don't you like that? Amen. And by getting to know Jesus, you're getting to know God the Father. Hallelujah. And that's what Matthew is telling us about in Christ's birth, that Jesus is extraordinary. That He is the embodiment of God here among us. Amen. So listen, listen to what he says. Do what he says. And this was a serious thing too. You take this seriously. And by the way, Herod took it seriously. <coughs> Matthew's addition to Jesus' story stresses the seriousness of Jesus. It was either stuck on a lozenger or a sip of coffee. Okay? I'll take the coffee. So, so Matthew's story here, and, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the seriousness of Jesus' personality, the seriousness of his claims. Jesus claimed to be something. You understand that? And because he claimed to be something, and because the angels said who he was, and Matthew proclaims this, he was a threat. You understand this? Jesus was a threat. Because he was who? King of the Jews. Amen. And it's laid out for us in chapter 2. And, and so when the Advent stories and sermons get to Matthew's second chapter, we focus on, we do this, and I've done it, and I don't apologize for it, but we focus on the wise men following the star, which is pretty awesome. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how far they came from. There's not quoted where they came from, but they came from a long distance, and they came in this giant, it wasn't just three camels. These guys were wealthy. Robbers would have killed them all. It was a big entourage. And they can protect themselves. We focus on finding Jesus and worship Him and, and bring wonderful gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Herod, on the other hand, had another agenda. When he finds that this one called the King of the Jews is coming, his attitude totally takes on a different turn. See, it's generally assigned to a small part of Christmas when we think of Herod, right? We kind of shove him off to the side. Because it was the shepherds that came. It was, it was the bowing down and worshiping Him. It was the wise men who came from a long distance to give gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which are all very symbolic. You understand that? Amen. But when Jesus came, it was a little bit different. So, we focus on finding Jesus and we worship Him 
and we tell the Christmas story, and we have Christmas preaching, because he does bring all that out. <clears throat> but this part of the story is very unpleasant. And it doesn't fit into God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. That part of it we show out. But I read to you a passage of scripture of the crying and the sorrow. Although Advent was gospel and it was good news and, and it was great for the masses who were in bondage of sin, this same story was bad news for Herod because he was the king and he took it seriously, very seriously. See, they didn't come saying, hey, we're looking for this, this uh, nice little child and we thought maybe he might be born here. They said, we're looking for the king of the Jews. Amen. <clears throat> We've seen his star. We've come to worship him. Herod, listen to this, Herod was a great, powerful, <laughs> capable, creative, influential, evil man. He was appointed by Rome to serve as the king of the Jews. And he was considered by Rome one of the most effective and most efficient king the region had ever had. And the Romans were pretty much masters of efficiency and then masters of evil too. And King Herod received high marks in the school of Romanism. High praise from them. These Roman leaders liked him because he beautified Jerusalem. He renovated and upgraded the temple. He constructed ports and fortresses and palaces. He forged a, 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 a place that would last decades after his death and people would still look up to him as this great king. And he was so good at governing the region that he reduced crime and collected taxes and suppressed dissent, which was always happening. And he was given the title a friend of Rome. This is King Herod. He wasn't called Herod the Great for nothing. He was an egomaniac. Are you getting this? He was suspicious of everything and everybody, and he was cruel. He murdered, as a young man, he murdered a number of people. As a king, he executed many members of his own family, including his wife. That's what King Herod is. And so in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, we hear the story of the slaughter of innocents. It wasn't out of character for him to say, well then if that's the king of the Jews, by the way, after the when he realizes the wise men aren't coming back to tell him where this Jesus is, then his ruling is, from two years age of age and under, every baby child will be slaughtered. He was in true sense an absolute ruler, a tyrant. He was at home in a brutal Roman society, and he proved it here. So I want you to get this. Herod's not a bit player in this story. He's a big player. He's the main character. Once again, we traditionally focus on the wise men from, from, from the Magi who traveled from the east following a star, get to Jerusalem, come to worship this baby king. That's all we know about the wise men, isn't it? But we know a lot about Herod. We don't know how many of them there were. I mentioned that earlier. We just know somewhere from the east, the Holy Land, somewhere they came, and, and maybe it was Saudi Arabia or Iraq or Persia, Iran. But here's what we don't know anything beyond that. What we know is that the Magi were, were this cast of, of learned men who, who had knowledge of all things, including astrology and even Hebrew prophecy. And I haven't figured this out. How did they get Hebrew prophecy tied in? Who knows? Is it important in the story? No, it's not. Other than they followed the star and they found Jesus and they bowed down and worshipped him awesome story. They might have traveled for a month, maybe longer. All I know is it was a large group of them. And, and I was thinking about where Jesus was in that little, that little setting. By the way, he, he wasn't in the stable anymore. You understand? He might have been close to two years of age by that time. So they were in a house somewhere and the star still led them. Are you getting this story? How cool it is? Because the shepherds came to the manger. But now they're in a the house somewhere, and the angel says, get out of town, go to Egypt. This guy's going to come and kill you. Mm -hmm. You understand that, that because Joseph listened to the angel, Jesus survived Herod's onslaught of killing all these babies. Mm -hmm. Commotion was caused by the... Here was the question that was asked. Now get this. The question that was asked of them, of King Herod's group, 
when they got there was, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Wait a minute. Herod's the king of the Jews. You understand this? That is an onslaught against his kingdom. You think he's going to sit still and go, hallelujah. So, for us, I mean, we, we think about it. We focus on the Magi and the shepherds. But the truth is, this is where the story really took a big turn. The chief priests and scribes and Hebrew prophetic text, all as they looked it over and studied it and discussed it, the question was political as well as spiritual. For Herod, political, king of the Jews. That's not a religious title. You understand that? That was a title given by man for the man king. Political title, political position, and the role of the king of the Jews was that he was the head of state. Are you following this? Because I, I honestly have not really pondered this a whole lot. This is something that, you know, all the years I've thought about this, I thought about Hank Herod, and I had him on the list of the, of, the, of the bad, 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 bad. But I never caught the fact that when, when the king of the Jews was announced, that this was a declaration that Christ wasn't just Messiah come to lead us religiously. He was the rightful, he was the rightful from, from way back. Amen. The rightful heir to the throne that day. Did you get that? The king of the Jews. Now, this wasn't a prophecy not being It was fulfilled. So the role of the king of the Jews is that he's the head of the state. And, and, and there already is a king of the Jews. His name is Herod the Great, right? That didn't go down well. So... Herod, who has all the power of the empire behind him, is faced with the question, there's a king of the Jews? <laughs> I don't know about you, but there's going to be trouble in paradise. Now, Herod is being nice to the wise men. You understand that one, right? You got that. Yeah, he didn't show him. Um, would you go find him? After, this is after they find out he's going to be born in, in Bethlehem. Would you go find him? And then, and then when you find him, could you come back here and let me know so I can worship him? Kill him. Right. What a sad story. The Bible says it troubled Herod and the entire city. These people weren't stupid, y'all. It, it would be like us saying today that that um, there's a new president. That would cause some concern amongst the politicians, would it not? Amen. Well, we got a new president coming. He has been born. And we're going to worship him. <laughs> Are you following that? It, that's not any different. So, so what, what they're saying is, Herod is hearing the wise men say, hey, we've got a new king. We've come to worship this new king. Where is he? Well, where should he be? At the king's house. He will be, according to king lineage, he will be the prince who would take the king's place when he died. You following the story? But they didn't say, we're looking for prince, the prince of the Jews. We're looking for the king of the Jews. Amen. King of lo kings and lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. I like that, don't you? Amen. So uh, it, it agitated them. It stirred them up. It created a sense of anxiety. And for a good reason. You see, a new king being born throws a shade on the current system and says, that's not right. And also opens the door for a political revolt from all the other Jews. Amen. And for Herod and those complicit with him, the nobles, the chief priests, the scribes, the empire, this was not good news. That's... Kind of crazy, isn't it? Yes. The good Jews have been looking for Messiah. You understand this? Amen. They weren't looking for an earthly king, though. They were looking for Messiah to rescue them from the Romans. Right. And they all knew Herod. 
And they knew the general state of unrest. And, and when they tell him that Bethlehem is a place where the Messiah King is going to go and he's going to be born there, they also know there's going to be some Jewish sorrow because somebody's going to suffer horribly for the King of the Jews being born there. Hey, here's something to ponder. Herod never met Jesus. Isn't that sad? Jesus was an infant, a little child, and final. And Herod was in his final years of reign. He was an older man. And the interaction between Jesus and Herod took place through a realm of ideas, uh, through this message coming out that the king of the Jews had been born. And in this massive, bloated kingdom estate, a toddler came in to mess everything up. Thank you, Lord. There's nothing so awesome as a baby, is there? They cry and squawk, and you pat them and change them and feed them, and, and they're happy. And they'll steal your hearts. And as they toddle around, you love it till they get in the twos. Then you wonder. I wonder if Jesus was the problem to his mom. I've always wondered that. I guess we'll never know, will we? But think about this. Power against potential. Herod's power against God's answering the prayers of the people and his plan for redemption that they still didn't grasp. It was oppression and darkness trying to smother a spark of hope. It was a well-armed, well-organized violence against a baby, Prince of Peace. That's kind of mismatched for a battle, don't you think? And then it took a horrible form because Herod took Jesus very seriously. Isn't that sad? He was a threat. The slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem was, was, was this maniac, this narcissistic tyrant lashing out to protect him and his system and the people that were in his group. Man, that sounds, that sounds so... What, how tragic. And you see, we discover we're told something different than I usually cover in most of my Advent sermons. I want you to get this part of the story because we need to understand there was a giant price tag attached to Christ's coming. And that lineage-wise, he was entitled to be the king of the Jews. Don't you like that? Amen. Mm -hmm. That Jesus was there to claim the throne of David is his. <laughs> That's powerful. Matthew wants his audience to understand this, that Jesus is the king. That he's king rightfully and by proper descent without shadow of a doubt. He's a rightful king of the Jews and though through Israel and, 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 and yet they are overcome by a political entity. But really if this happened the way it should then, then Roman would be, Rome would be gone and Jesus would have been installed as king. Jesus is the king of the Jews. And it means specifically that, that the king, that Jesus is king to Matthew's audience. So as he tells the story to all the Jews, he wants them to get that this one who came is God's king of the Jews by proper lineage. And he lays it out for them family by family. Isn't this cool? Amen. Because we don't think about this. I'm still back at the shepherds going, wow. <laughs> Who's going to watch the sheep while we go bow down and worship to this baby? Those are things I think of, you know. And so, so what, what, what happened was, I want you to get this, what happened was that for Jesus being born, not intended to be, but became very political. And sometimes we say, you know, she, keep, the, keep politics out of the church. Excuse me, I read this, right? This is about as political as it gets. That Jesus had real and actual claim to the actual rulership of the children of Abraham, Abraham through Isaac. And there's a lot more. And, and since we're the, listen to me, since we're the children of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus, are you ready for this? Then Jesus has real, actual claim to be our king as well. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to do a little dance, but that's pretty. That's crazy. That Jesus of the Old Testament and New Testament 
has a right to be the King of kings and Lord of lords for us today. Hallelujah. There's something we need to know and grasp and understand. When you took Christ's forgiveness, listen to me. When you took His forgiveness and you accepted His Lordship, did you get it? When you in faith and repentance took His name, you aligned yourself with the rulership and yielded yourself to His authority, the King of kings and Lord of lords became your King. He's not simply Lord in a title sense. He's not simply Lord in a vague spiritual sense. He's Lord of lords in actual reality for you and you serve Him. Amen. Amen. We sang that song this morning. It was, uh, it was called an ancient Hebrew folk song. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory. Alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory. Alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory. Uh, we sang that. And, and the reason we sang it on purpose is He is our King. Yes. Our King. Glory. Hallelujah. Not your, if He's not your King, listen to me. If He's not your King, He's not your Savior. That's right. Amen. Amen. And Matthew stresses the extraordinary difference of Jesus. He's extraordinary because His origins are divine. He was born of a virgin. Virgin birth. I don't, scientists out there, hang it on your beak. This is what the Bible said. The Word of God says, Born of a virgin. Not possible. Yes, it is with God. Do you like that? Extraordinary because of his origins are divine. He's extraordinary because he embodies God in the flesh. Amen. That means two things for us. One, Jesus can make extraordinary claims and make extraordinary demands on us. Don't you like that? Amen. He, he claims and demands us to follow him. And by the way, it's through legitimate genealogy. So if you did a DNA on Jesus, you could trace it back to Abraham. Amen. Pretty cool, huh? Amen. So we should listen to what Jesus says, uh, to what he says, and do what he tells us to do. Amen. And of course, secondly, since Jesus is the very embodiment of God, He's the key to understanding and knowing God. You want to know more about God? You want to know His character? Study Jesus. You want to know about His holiness? Look at your, your Savior Jesus. You want to know about His love and grace and mercy? Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus as the embodiment of God. He was worthy of worship. I was thinking. The worship of the wise men. Of His disciples. One of the great ones that I love to preach about was at Simon's house. There was a woman who came who heard Jesus was going to be there. You remember the story? Amen. And she broke this jar of ointment, perfume, alabaster. And poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her tears. And Jesus said to Simon, I've got something to say to you, dude. Generally, when a guest is invited, your servants wash your feet. And you're making fun of her, hadn't said anything out loud yet, because of what she's done, and yet she had more to do with me than you did. Because she has washed my feet and kissed my feet and cleansed them, and you didn't do that part of the story. So Matthew stresses the, the importance of, that Herod and those around him understood, they understood who he was, and they understood that he was a threat, and, and finally they killed him. They thought they had beat him, but they didn't, did they? No. They understood the threat that his existence posed to their system of power, and they shut him down, they thought. By the way, it's interesting to know that then Jesus, for 33 years, they don't hear of Jesus. Have you thought about this? Until he was a man. The, to the religious leaders, if they remembered that fiasco, and I'm sure they did because of all the babies that were killed. They didn't think anything of it until Jesus came back and said, I am He. You like that? I'm the one. And so Matthew wants him to get this, that, that one of the reasons for the gospel focuses on the kingdom of God is because Matthew took Jesus as king as seriously as Herod did. Don't you like that? Amen. And what Matthew knew is that if the followers of Jesus lived the Jesus way, it would have a real life impact on the systems of the world. And it did, and it has, and it does. Did you get that? Amen. 
One of the questions I'd ask you probably is, do you take Jesus as seriously as Herod and Matthew did? It wasn't just a kingdom set up in a place in Jerusalem. It was a spiritual kingdom that very few, even today, comprehend. Do we understand what it means for Jesus to be king? Do we grasp the real life effect of what he, what, 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 what had to be when we treat Jesus' commands as if they're law for living? I think it should be. Should it? If Jesus said, love everybody, love your neighbors, yourself. By the way, their neighbor was not the person next door. It was the country next door that they hated with a passion. Mm. And if we took, I want you to get this, if we took it seriously, if we took it seriously and his commands were our laws, we no longer could be a Democrat or Republican. We couldn't be a conservative or a liberal. More importantly, we couldn't identify as any of these things because we recognize that politics of the kingdom of God promote values that none of the earth has or emulates. Did you like that? Mm -hmm. That we'd not call ourselves a capitalist or a socialist. That we'd have a different way of thinking about conducting our personal economies. We look at Jesus seriously and we wouldn't promote war. Think about this, or abortion, or euthanasia, because Christ, our default, would have mercy and peace and life. Don't you like that? Yeah. And if we took Jesus seriously, we would respect the, the need for integrity at work. How about that one? Amen. We'd understand the need for our work to be in alignment with Christ's character and his kingdom. I like that one, don't you? Amen. Amen. And we'd be compassionate with those who are in need. There wouldn't be need for somebody sitting on a street corner with a sign, need food. The only time I'd ever put a sign out there, I was thinking about this, I ought to put a pair of coveralls and put, need money for car. But, uh, you know, I don't think I'll do it, but you know. I, I read this yesterday. I thought I'd read this to you. Six, and, and the numbers may have changed recently, but at the time this was written, 65% of Americans claimed to be Christian. Can you imagine the impact on our nation if 65% of those people who claim to be Christians took Jesus seriously? Culture wars would die out. Political climate and hostility would be gone. If 65% of Americans took Jesus seriously, they could elect a different kind of politician because there would be a different type of political group of people to elect. That's interesting, isn't it? If 65% of Americans took Jesus seriously, more swords would be beaten into plowshares and less iron forged into swords, guns. And therefore, we'd be more interested in conciliation than conflict of making peace. Don't you like that? Amen. If 65% more people took Jesus seriously, can you imagine what the country would look like if 65% of people took Jesus seriously in America? This would be the most awesome place to be, wouldn't it? But you can leave the field of dreams for a minute and imagine what, what would this congregation be like and all those out online that are listening today if we took Jesus as seriously as Matthew did and Herod did. You see, very easily in the short term, we could no longer be. But if, if our world took Jesus really seriously, our churches would be packed and we'd have to build the walls out a little bit. Or we'd go to another place to have another building. And so I'm telling you, if Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that if you've received His forgiveness and His grace, you've embraced His Lordship, I'm telling you that if we at the church would decide that this Christmas season we're going to take Him seriously as King, it start the most revolutionary change in us since our real conversion, don't you think? Let me, let me repeat that. If we at the church would decide that this Christmas season to really take Jesus as King seriously, that'd be the start of the most revolutionary change in us since our initial conversion. And they would introduce us as they who turned the world upside down are here now. That's pretty good. Amen. And so, let's allow this Christmas season the introduction of Jesus to the world that Matthew reminds us here that Jesus truly is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is Lord.
He is Lord. He is risen from the grave and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord indeed. I'm wrapping up. And that we can live our lives in a way that reflects the true to life nature of His Lordship. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We can enjoy the angels singing as they did. and We can feel the thrill of the shepherd's awe and thrill as they bowed down and worshipped him. We can marvel at the, the journey of the wise men and weep at those who've lost their babies under Herod's jealousy. When you hear the songs, rejoice. But don't forget that Christ came as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Don't forget that there were those who paid the price because he came marvel that there would be men who would travel for long distance to find this king of the Jews. Let us find him. And when you tree the, see the Christmas trees sparkling with the trinkets and lights on them and illuminate things, or you think of presents you give and you purchase, don't give gifts because you feel obligated to give gifts. Give them because you were given the greatest gift. His name is Jesus. Kings, Lord of Lords. Stand with me please. We're going to pray. I've got two more, two more messages on this. We'll have Christmas celebration this coming. As we bow before the Lord, Father, we bow before you. We've read this Christmas story a multitude of times. We, we celebrated Christmas since we were infants. And we never cease to be amazed at your new revelations to us in this journey. We've watched and read about the, the wise men and the shepherds, the angels singing, the star leading, the angels proclaiming that you're going to bear a child. His name will be Jesus. He's going to save the people. But we missed the seriousness of the connection of the King of the Jews. Father, this morning as we bow before you, we give you honor and praise and glory. We thank you, Lord, for your word and for the gospels where these four men who wrote these words will remind us from each from a different perspective that you came for a purpose. To bring redemption to the lost and broken. Have mercy on us. Pour your spirit on us, Lord. Never let us forget how important it is to walk with you. Never let us get too busy mm -hmm. to be reminded that you came with a purpose knowing full good and well it would end up in your death on the cross. We are eternally grateful. Mm -hmm. Father, would you forgive us for getting so busy in life that we stop being in awe in your presence. Would you bring us back? Fill us with your presence. And then give us joy unspeakable as we think about you. And full of glory. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Now if you're out there, we invite you to find a place quiet and just say, Lord, we refresh my heart. And for those of you in the house today, this day, ponder, think about this story. With God, I love you. We'll see you soon. May the God of peace fill you through and through. And may you have the joy of Christmas. With God, I love you. We'll see you next Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Amen. Amen.